the place into which my valet had ventured to make entrance, rather than to permit me, in my desperately wounded condition, to pass a night in the open air. It was one of those piles of coming a gloom and grandeur which have so long frowned upon the Apennines. To all appearance it had been, and very lately abandoned, we established ourselves in one of the smallest and least sumptuous furnished apartments. It lay in a remote turret of the building. Its decorations were rich, yet tattered and antique. Its walls were hung with tapestry and bedecked with manifold and multiform armorial trophies, together with an unusually great number of very spirited modern paintings, in frames of rich gold and arabesque. In these paintings, which depended from the walls not only in the main surfaces, but in very many nooks which the bizarre architecture of the chateau rendered necessary. It had caused me to take deep interest, so that I bade Pedro to close the heavy shutters of the room. I felt the perusal of a small volume which had been found upon the pillow, and which purported to criticize and describe the paintings. Long, long I read, and devoutly, devoutly I gazed. Rapidly and gloriously the hours flew by and the deep midnight came. The position of the candelabrum displeased me, and outreaching my hand with difficulty, rather than disturb my slumbering valet. I placed it so as to throw its rays more fully upon the book. But the action produced an effect altogether unanticipated. The rays of the numerous candles, for there were many, now fell within an inch of the room which had been thrown into deep shape by one of the bedposts. I thus saw in vivid light a picture all unnoticed before. It was the portrait of a young girl, just ripening into womanhood. I glanced at the painting hurriedly, and then I closed my eyes. Why I did this was not at first apparent even to my own perception, but while my lids remained shut, I ran over my mind my reason for so shutting them. It was an impulsive movement to gain time for my thought, to make sure that my vision had not deceived me to calm and subdue my fancy for a more sober and more certain gaze. In a very few moments, I again looked physically at the painting. That I now saw right, I could not and would not doubt, for the first flashing of the candles upon that canvas had seemed to dissipate the dreamy stupor which was stealing over my senses and to start me at once into walking life. The portrait. I have already said, was that of a young girl. It was a mere head and shoulders, done in what is technically to her a vineyard manner. The arms, the bottom, and even the ends of the radiant hijab melted imperceptibly into the vague yet deep shadow which formed the background of the whole. The frame was over, richly gilded in filigree and moresque, as a thing of art Nothing could be more admirable than the painting itself. I saw eagerly the volume which discussed the paintings and their histories. Turning to the number which designated the over poetry, I there read the vague and quaint words which follow. She was a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee. And evil was the hour when she saw, and loved, and wedded the painter. He, passionate, studious, austere, and having already a bright in his art. She, a maiden of rarest beauty, and not more lovely than full of glee, all light and smiles, loving and cherishing all things, hating only the art which was her rival, dreading only the palette and brushes, and other untoward instruments which deprived her of the countenance of her lover.
But he, the painter, took glory in his work, which went from hour to hour and from day to day. It was a terrible thing for this lady to hear the painter speak of his desire to portray even his young bride. But she was humble and obedient, and sat meekly for many weeks in the dark, high turret chamber where the light dripped upon the pale canvas only from overhead. And he was a passionate, and wild, and moody man who became lost in reveries. He could not see that the light which fell so ghastly in that lone turret withered the health and the spirits of his bride. Who pined visibly to all but him, yet she complied uncomplainingly, because she saw that the painter took a fervid and burning pleasure in his task, and wrought day and night to depict her who so loved him, yet who grew more daily dispirited and weak. As the painter drew nearer to his conclusion, no one was allowed to the chariot. For the painter had grown wild with the ardour of his work, and turned his eyes from canvas merely, even to regard the countenance of his wife. And he could not see that the tint which he spread upon the canvas were drawn from the cheeks of her who sat beside him. And when many weeks had passed, and but little remained to do so, Save one brush upon the mouth, and one tint upon the eye, the spirit of the lady again flickered up as the flame within the socket of the lamp. And then the brush was given, and then the tint was placed. But in the next, while he yet gazed, he grew tremulous and very pallid, and aghast, and crying with a loud voice, This is indeed life itself. turned suddenly to regard his beloved. But she was dead. <laughs>